So we're going to have a presentation by Len, which I haven't seen, but I'm looking forward to because, as I said, I think he was shortchanged at the September 26 CHM event, where he can only talk about we raised $20 million and I was a would-be forklift operator and blah blah blah. So why don't you show that presentation? Now? Sure. I'm not sure it's that much different from what I showed there. How many people were at the event 25th uh, anniversary? About uh, a third, something like that. Okay. Let me go through this quickly. Uh, I think you uh, know a lot of the story. Um, it originally started from uh, Gordon Bell, who wrote a book called Computer Structures that was all about documenting the important computers of the world. And he thought those shouldn't just be preserved on paper, that he should actually start preserving some of the machines themselves. So he started his own private collection of historic computers. That was one of his motivations. The second motivation was the machine on the right. That's the MIT Whirlwind computer. Very historic machine. Core memory was invented for it. And it was going to be thrown out. And Gordon and, and uh, Ken Olson and Bob Everett, who had worked on the machine, went to the Smithsonian saying, you've got to preserve this thing. It's a national treasure, international treasure. The Smithsonian said, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. So Gordon and uh, Ken Olson decided to start a computer museum because this is a picture of all the computer museums in the world. <laughs> Zero. Zero. There was a lack. You needed one. Digital Equipment Corporation in Marlboro, Massachusetts was the leading mini computer company, very successful. They had a, a, a wonderful large building with empty space. So they decided to turn some of that empty space into a computer museum. They got some interns to, to paint the walls. That, that on the right is uh, Gwen Bell, who was Gordon Bell's wife, who volunteered to be the full-time unpaid director of this uh, museum. and. They created the Digital Computer Museum, which ran in Marlboro from 1979 to 1983. It was 6,000 square feet. It was a huge museum. Uh, and they established a plan for the museum that meant it was not just exhibits. It was also lectures and archives and research and publications. This could be the plan of our museum today. I mean, this was a brilliant plan for a, a museum in some sense, we are simply executing now on Gordon Bell's original plan for the Digital Computer Museum in 1979. The problem was, it was the Digital Computer Museum, which was a pun, right? Digital meant digital computer, but digital also meant Digital Equipment Corporation. That made it very hard to get funding from other manufacturers <laughs> of computers. So they decided to drop the digital name. They decided to move to downtown Boston to Museum Wharf. Uh, and became and become not an uh, arm of Digital Equipment Corporation, but a fully independent nonprofit organization. Became the Computer Museum, ran from 1984 to 1999. They moved the collection from Marlboro. Every year the collection was getting bigger and bigger to Museum Wharf. Uh, they created a wonderful set of very geeky exhibits uh, about technology. Uh, including these great dioramas, kind of you know old school museum technology with mannequins inside, showing how people would have used those computers. Uh, they were they were really great. I got to see it uh, once. Is that, some a robot? that is not a robot. No, it should have been a robot, but it wasn't. <laughs> they also started a, a, a lecture series. They they gave the first fellows <coughs> award to Grace Murray Hopper in 1980 five or six, something like that. They had a terrific series of uh, talks, uh, both in the afternoon and the evening. But as I described, what was happening was that the computer industry, this is mid-90s, had left Boston. They couldn't get funding except for uh, kids' education stuff, so they, just, they started morphing into this uh, kids-oriented museum. By the way, if you want all sorts of details that Gordon has collected on that phase of the museum, go to the website, tcm.computerhistory.org. And the article that he wrote, which I had, yeah. it's on the ithistory.org website. ithistory.org website. In the meantime, not knowing about any of that, I was teaching E 282 and came to the conclusion that Silicon Valley needs a computer museum. So I started writing white papers and talking it up and trying to convince people that, you know, we can do this. It doesn't, you know, it's not that big a deal. Uh, we were looking for locations. Then Gordon Bell shows up at my office, and he says, what are you doing? And I, I explained it to him, and he said, you're crazy. Don't start your own museum. Join us. We'll restart in California what 
I had tried to do in Boston and kind of lost its way. It was a, a classic kind of Trojan horse uh, operation. Uh, I joined the board of the Boston Museum specifically to start the West Coast Outpost, and we saw the handwriting on the wall that the mothership in Boston was going to go slowly downhill, and we hoped we were going to have success. We started out by scrounging. Uh, I got through a friend of mine some free, decrepit warehouse space in Moffett Field, right at the foot of the wonderfully iconic uh, dirigible hangar, and we started moving in. Notice the sandbags in front of the door on the right. That place flooded, the roof leaked. I mean, it was a terrible place to be storing the world's treasures of computers, but it was free, and we had no other opportunity. So we moved the collection. Uh, Gwen Bell was the instigator of this without um, asking the appropriate questions of the board back in Boston. We loaded up the trucks with, <laughs> with what was in the back rooms that nobody else was seeing, and we transported it to California and moved it into this decrepit warehouse. Some of the things were kind of hard to move. This is the Johnny Act being slowly lowered to the ground by two back-to-back -back trucks with their tailgates trying to move in synchronization so we wouldn't lose it over the side. That's sage. I'm sorry? That's sage. That's sage. What did I say? Johnny oh, yeah. Act. No. Yes, that's about sage. About the same size. It's about the same size. Probably the same, You're same absolutely same right. That is, that is sage. We even moved some stuff into the dirigible hangar that had all this storage on the side walls. So, we, so yeah. at that time there are no owner in Boston, you just okay, took everything? You can't call out, you have rules for you, you have to raise your hand. Just yeah, there, yeah, there was an owner. The owner was the computer was the owner was the computer museum. This was a subsidiary of the computer museum. So we weren't changing ownership. We were just moving it from one location of the museum to another. Perfectly perfectly legal. So we cleaned up all, all of the artifacts uh, in this warehouse space. We didn't know what half of it was. A lot of it came in boxes. They were unmarked. Gwen Bell had a Word document at one point which she purported to be the catalog of the collection, but it had long since been you know, moribund. It wasn't kept up to date. So we had no complete catalog of what we were getting, but we knew that it was important. So we created this thing called visible storage, which was a bunch of artifacts set out in a place with very few signs in a way that people who knew what they were looking at could appreciate the, the artifacts. And it was a little difficult because Moffett Field was a controlled access federal facility, so uh, you know, our visitorship was limited, but it was great. And, and uh, we, we started telling people about it. This is an article from uh, the San Francisco Examiner. I don't know why they covered us. Maybe it was a slow news day. but. No, it, it was it was it was uh, great um, uh, advertising for us, and, and I kept writing more white papers and talking to people, and dreaming about building the building. In the meantime, NASA was dreaming too. They were dreaming about turning this whole area near the dirigible hangar into a research park. And notice the circled words. It says computer museum. They were going to give us a land lease of two acres to build our building on and it would be part of this whole research part. This sounds like a wonderful idea. So we started planning. This was what they were going to build, by the way, inside the dirigible hangar. It was going to be the California Air and Space Center, sort of the Smithsonian Air and Space Center of, of the West. You know, we drank the Kool-Aid. This sounded like a great idea. So we started planning. Our first uh, proposal was to build a beta building, a uh, very simple tilt-up building, uh, you know, metal frame building in front of the dirigible hangar where they were giving us our space, where we would open the interim museum. That would eventually become a warehouse. And then we started talking to architects, and we did an architectural competition and designed buildings, and we may even have the phone core models of these somewhere around. It was, you know, we didn't have the money to build these buildings yet, but we were fundraising and it was going pretty well and we were hoping that eventually we would. Well, a couple of things happened. One is that it slowly dawned on us that NASA moves with the speed of a federal bureaucracy. <laughs> and it would be a long time before they created their research park. In fact, they're still talking about creating a research park. You know, we're startup people. We just don't have the patience for that. So we figured we've got to do something else. The other thing that happened was, this was 1999, 2000, the dot-com bust happened, which in some ways is a bad thing, but in some ways was a good thing. Suddenly there was all this real estate in Silicon Valley that was empty, that we could look at. 
And this was a building that was Silicon Graphics uh, Sales and Marketing Headquarters. They had since sold it to a uh, investment company. And we bought it. Now, we didn't quite have the money to buy it, but I went to the board and said, I want to borrow $25 million <laughs> by issuing a bond to buy this building. I sweated bullets during that board meeting because the Boston Museum had failed trying to retire a mortgage on their building of less than a million dollars. And I'm saying, okay, I want to borrow $25 million. You're a gutsy guy. I'm a gutsy guy. But uh, it worked. Uh, we, uh, our fundraising went well um, over the period of, if you count from 1996 to, uh, I don't know, 20. 13 or something like that, we raised over $100 million. Some of it went into an endowment, some of it went into paying off for this bond, uh, some of it went into building exhibits, but uh, we did in Silicon Valley what they could not have done in Boston. Is the bond paid off at this point? Not all of it. We have $7 million left, but we are paying less than 1% on that $7 million. Wow. So we invested instead. We actually have the money to pay it off, but it's not a good financial. So. We had this building, we had to move the equipment yet again. These poor artifacts are being moved and moved. Um, we had more stuff now to, to move. Uh, we created a new version of visible storage within that building. I'm sure some of you uh, remember um, seeing that. Uh, we started restoring old computers. Um, we revived the Fellows Award. They had done Grace Marty Hopper in, 19, in eight, 1986. Uh, we did. Uh, Jay Forrester in 1995 or six, I think, but then every year since then, um, we have done fellow awards. But right now, working so it was on- was a big gap then? Like it was a big gap. 20 year gap? No, no, it was uh, 80, 86 to 95 was the gap. Um, and we eventually ran out of space in the building because we were creating more and more um, exhibits uh, and wanted to make that building mostly dedicated to public space, so we bought a warehouse. We have a 25,000 square foot warehouse over on the Some of the poor equipment got moved yet again, although we're getting much more professional about how we do that, so less damage happens. Uh, we own this building, by the way. We didn't have to take out a debt for that. But we still were dreaming about building the exhibit that we all wanted to build. We did temporary exhibits. This is one that was up for several years on the history of computer chess. 50-year quest to build a, to, to make a computer as smart as human beings and playing chess. And then, remember that joke where you know some professor has all of these equations on the board and all these other equations on the board, and right in the middle it says, "Then a miracle occurred." <laughs> well, then a miracle occurred. John Holler arrived, and somehow we were able to build the exhibits that we were working on for so many years.